Thank you for joining us at Microsoft Research Summit 2021. My name is Kobe Nisim from Georgetown University, and my talk title is Towards Bridging Between Legal and Technical Approaches to Data Protection. This is based on joint work with Michael Altman, Aloni Cohen, and Alex Wood. So, more and more uh, decisions of legal nature are made in computer systems. Maybe the first example that has been with us for, new, for many years is credit score. And this uh, score provides an assessment of the potential risk that a consumer possesses. The score is calculated by credit bureaus that collect a lot of financial information and is used in a variety of financial uh, decisions by banks, lenders, and some other transactions also. A second example is uh, the tools that were developed, these are machine learning tools, uh, that were developed to assist uh, legal decision making by judges, uh, probation officers, and so on. And a couple of examples is predicting risk of recidivism and predicting failure to appear in court. And this definitely have uh, potential consequences to uh, defendants. And more generally, we are all exposed to personalization all the time uh, through targeted behavioral advertising, personalized recommendations, um, and, and so on. And all these applications raise uh, all the time uh, worries about privacy risks, surveillance, discrimination, manipulation, and a little more. But all these applications are built from simpler and maybe uh, mundane-looking building blocks. Uh, uh, they are built of decisions on the collection, storage, deletion, processing, and sharing of personal information. And the number of such operations is just huge. I don't know exactly how many decisions are made daily, but clearly uh, a lot of them. And these are mostly opaque to users, to experts, and to policymakers. And this is in spite of the regulation addressing some of this decision, at least to um, uh, some extent, and definitely the more modern regulations like the General Data Protection Regulation in the EU, the California Consumer Protection Act, the California Privacy Rights Act, and we're likely to see some uh, other uh, regulations like that in the near future. So the question is whether we can make sure that these decisions that are made in computer systems, whether they agree with the legal desiderata and the legal requirements. And I want to say that this is important not only for compliance. Compliance is often an easier question because for compliance, officers can claim that uh, they are using the uh, best technologies at the time and so on, but it's really important that we would understand the relationship between the desiderata that is expressed in legal data protection standards and the actual protection that is provided by the technology that we use. And there are many challenges towards this, and maybe the most basic ones are definitional challenges. So from now on, I'm going to uh, focus on privacy, and privacy is a data protection concept that has emerged uh, in legal, philosophical uh, thinking, in the social sciences, and so on. Uh, but it also has a technical uh, face. So uh, privacy has this kind of dual nature. And on the technical side, if we think of how we uh, deal with privacy, uh, we have come up with uh, concepts like encryption, zero knowledge, secure multi-party computation, differential privacy, and many more. And these are concepts that are defined using precise, rigorous mathematical formulations. They leave no gray areas. A system is either uh, an encryption system or not. Either it is uh, provides your knowledge or not, and so on. Um, and we reason about these systems and about the concepts using mathematical language. So on the technical side, we're trying to be very precise and very crisp. On the other hand, uh, when we look at legal standards of privacy, we see a collection of other concepts. Maybe the most important is private uh, identifiable information. And we also see other concepts like the identification, anonymization, linkability, inference risks, statistical purposes, opt out, their deletion, consent, and quite a few more. And these, the definitions of these concepts, many leave uh, a lot 
to be uh, queried. There are many gray areas that are not precise from a mathematical standpoint. And even more so, sometimes the legal desiderata seems in disagreement with our current scientific and technical understanding. So a question is how we can breach these really big differences. So I'd like to uh, mention some relevant work in this direction. In 2005, Helen Nissenbaum presented the uh, framework of contextual integrity. It's an interesting framework that combines technical and normative notions. It speaks about norms, uh, privacy as norms, about information flow between contexts. It is not defined using mathematical language, it's not mathematically precise, but there were attempts to formulate aspects of contextual integrity in logic, in particular this uh, work by Barth et al. Jumping in a few years ahead, let me mention the work we did at Harvard on the FERPA. FERPA is a legal standard. This is the Family, Educational Rights and Privacy Act. And we uh, formalized uh, the privacy standard trying to answer a question of whether a, a, a concept that we were working with, uh, differential privacy, whether the use of differential privacy satisfies the uh, requirements of FERPA. Um, in this work, we observed quite a few gaps uh, between the technical and legal approaches. And in a paper with Alex Wood, we uh, wrote about these uh, uh, gaps and the challenges that um, they pose. Work by uh, Alani Cohen and Snow Park, followed by Sarah Scheffler and uh, Mayank Varya, uh, is on compelled decryption and foregone conclusion. Uh, the question here is when can the government compel individuals to decrypt their information according to the foregone conclusion doctrine? This is a doctrine uh, that says uh, that uh, information is, uh, conclusion is foregone if the compelled information adds little or nothing to the sum of total. Uh, some total of the government's information. And they use uh, paradigms from cryptography in their definitions. Uh, the right to, to be forgotten and more generally data deletion was addressed in a work by Gart et al. and in a work by Aloni Cohen and later Mike Altman and Alex Wood, we discussed uh, a notion from the GTPR singling out that I'm going to focus on uh, in a few minutes. So this is the structure of the talk. Uh, we're going to focus on the modeling, the mathematical modeling of a legal concept, and then we would apply the model in what I would call legal theorems. Before that, we're gonna have a brief background, so we, I will introduce a few concepts, and then we'll end with a summary. And the two concepts we'll begin with are canonymity and differential privacy. So let me present canonymity. It's a concept that was uh, uh, developed by uh, Samarati and Sweden. And the idea is, um, as in this picture, we have data collected about individuals, and via suppression and generalization, we make sure that any combination of potentially identifying attributes, like in the picture, appears at least k times. So in the picture, we see an example of a two anonymized data set. On the left, we see the original data. On the right, we see the two anonymized version. So now uh, I cannot tell whether my neighbor from zip code 23456 uh, had a heart disease or a viral disease. So some privacy may be preserved. It's a very natural concept. It's easy to understand and it falls a, a class of attacks that is called linkage attacks. Um, many regulations seem to equate privacy and anonymity, and anonymity seems to work well with these regulations. But uh, people have uh, uh, identified weaknesses in the concept, uh, in particular uh, homogeneity attacks, background attacks, and very importantly, composition attacks. Second concept I want to present is differential privacy. It's a concept that was developed by Cynthia Work, Fatima McSherry, myself, and Adam Smith in 2006. And this concept involves uh, 
uh, it's a requirement on analysis, and to understand it, we will uh, we will compare what happens in what I will call an ideal world, a privacy ideal world, and a real world. So think about my privacy ideal world. My information here is not included in the analysis. So the analysis is performed, and there is an outcome to the analysis, but without my information. Hence, I think that my privacy is not at risk, at least in some uh, particular sense. In the real world, my information is included in the, in the analysis. Hence, I'm potentially at risk. And differential privacy requires that the outcome, outcomes in the ideal and the real world would be in some sense similar. There is a parameter, epsilon, for measuring this similarity. And the idea is that if epsilon, if the similarity is very high, epsilon is very low, um, then um, what happens in the real world is very similar to what happens in my ideal world because my privacy is preserved in the ideal world, it would also be preserved in the real world. Okay, and this can be formulated mathematically. I'm not going to get into the language here. Um, I just want to say that differential privacy was shown to allow a variety of computations like descriptive statistics, machine learning tasks, synthetic data generation, and, and, and a lot more. Um, it's a mathematical concept, so mathematicians, computer scientists can reason about it using the tools that they have, but it's not so easy to explain, and we don't uh, yet understand well how uh, it relates to concepts uh, in uh, coming from legal standards of privacy. So I'm getting to the main uh, uh, part of the presentation where we'll discuss the modeling of a legal concept. We'll begin with the concepts from the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, which is called singling out, and we will develop a technical concept which, which we will call predicate single, singling out. We will not claim that they are the same. The modeling will not achieve singling out exactly, but we'll uh, still claim that this modeling is useful. So let's read from the GDPR. Article 1 of the standard says, this regulation lays down rules relating to the protection of natural persons with regard to the processing of personal data. And in Article 4, it explains that personal data means any information relating to an identified or identifiable natural person directly or indirectly. And furthermore, in the recital 26, there is an explanation to determine whether a natural person is identifiable, account should be taken of all the means reasonably likely to be used, such as singling out, to identify the natural person directly or indirectly. So from these uh, pieces of text, we can learn that if you can single out in the data, then the data is identifiable, and hence this is personal data, and under the preview of the uh, GDPR. Now, there is no uh, explanation in GDPR of what singling out means, but we have uh, 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 guidance documents by the Article 29 Working Party that was set up for the Data Protection Directive that preceded the GDPR. The GDPR. Uh, this group produced opinions, recommendations, and reports providing expert opinion and guidelines on the interpretation of the DB DPD requirements. It was replaced by the European Data Protection Board in 2018. And here's what they say. They say, as regards indirectly identified or identifiable persons, this category typically relates to the phenomenon of unique combinations, whether small or large in size. A name itself uh, may, not, uh, may not be necessary in all cases to ident identify an individual. This may happen when other identifiers are used to single someone out. And furthermore, in another document, the uh, working party compared uh, various technologies, privacy technology, in particular, anonymity and differential privacy, and asking whether singling out remains a risk. With respect to anonymity, they said no. With respect to differential privacy, they say uh, may not. So let's think about this concept and whether we can uh, uh, define it mathematically. 
And something that is very natural, also seems to follow very well the guidelines of the Article 29 Working Party, is to identify singling out as isolation. Let me say what I mean by that. But to present the analysis, I would like first to present it a, first, a simple model. Okay? So we would assume that we have a data set that uh, contains record randomly sampled uh, from some underlying distribution. Think about if uh, the concept of a probability distribution is, is not familiar, think about it as sampling from uh, a large population. Then this data set is fed into an anonymization mechanism and the mechanism outputs some outcome, whether this is a, a, a k-anonymized uh, data set or uh, the outcome of statistical analysis, uh, what not. And this is given to an adversary, this is the singling out adversary, and the adversary is going to output a description, a predicate on the records. For instance, uh, uh, somebody who's doing a theoretical computer science, like me, and Tol. The adversary's goal is given the output of the mechanism to create a predicate that matches exactly one row in X. This is what we call isolation. And here's our definitional attempt. We say that the anonymization mechanism M is secure against signaling out if no adversary can isolate a row except with very, very tiny probability. And this is over all the relevant randomness in this, uh, in this process. And this looks very intuitive until you begin examining this idea and you find out that it is either impossible or at least very problematic. And let me show why. I'll show it by an example. Think about a trivial adversary. So the trivial adversary does not get any outcome from an anonymization mechanism. Okay, so if the trivial adversary would manage to isolate in the data, we cannot claim that this is because of the output it got from the anonymization mechanism. Simply did not get that. So here's an example. Assume the data set uh, contains 365 random birth dates. Okay, and the, and the singling out adversary knows that, but nothing more. Signaling out adversary could output a predicate like born on October 23rd, okay? In expectation, this, this agrees with the description of one person in the, in the data set, but the adversary does not know whether that is the case or not. But a, a simple calculation uh, gives that the adversary does manage to isolate a row in the data set with probability uh, 37%, which is quite high. So maybe if the adversary tries three times with three different data sets, then uh, the adversary would be likely to succeed at least once. Um, so this uh, trivial isolation is a problem for the previous definition and we need to uh, fix it. I want to say that this is just an example which we can generalize, all that is needed is that the uh, data set X is sampled from a distribution that has enough uncertainty, enough variety, which is the, um, uh, the common case. So we want to fix this notion of singling out as isolation. And what we'll ask is when is it the case that isolation is actually interesting, it's non-trivial. Okay, and here is the idea. Singling out happens when uh, I, A manages to isolate with um, a probability that is significantly uh, higher than the baseline. Let me give you a couple of examples. For instance, continuing with the data set with 365 birth dates and the predicate born on October 23rd, we saw that um, even without getting any access to, to the outcome of the anonymizing mechanism, um, an attacker can succeed in isolating with uh, high probability, 37%. So this is not uh, impressive if an attacker claims that this is what they can do. But if the attacker actually succeeds with much higher probability to isolate, let's say 99%, then this seems non-trivial. 
and maybe in the other direction when we fix uh, here a, 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 a description that is so specific that it's likely that no person on earth actually satisfies this description. Now, if the attacker succeeds with um, uh, descriptions that are so unlikely, even with a small probability like 1%, then we would say that this, this is non-trivial. So this brings us to the definition that we call security against predicate singling out. So again, we're not claiming that this exactly models signaling out from the GDPR, but a concept that is related to it, and we'll examine that relationship in a few slides. Okay, so this is the definition, and informal and simplified. We say that the mechanism M is secure against predicate singling out attacks. If there's not, if for no uh, distribution D and no uh, adversary A, it is the case that A isolates with a description that is extremely, extremely, extremely rare and succeed in doing that with uh, non-negligible uh, probability. Now, this may sound too strong, and one of the things to do, hence, is to see whether this definition allows any kind of utility from the data. And indeed, it is the case that we can extract utility, and maybe the most basic uh, statistical uh, query is a count query. And here's the mechanism. Uh, G is a description. Uh, the mechanism counts the number of rows in the database X that fit the description G. And um, for instance, how many people in the data set are diabetic? And we can prove mathematically that uh, this mechanism, actually it's a family of mechanism, uh, they are all predicate singling out uh, secure. And we can do that with uh, a few other simple uh, kinds of mechanism. Now, uh, once we have a mathematical definition of a concept, the definition itself is also a mathematical object and we can ask questions about it. And one very important question to ask is whether uh, uh, predicate singling out self-composes. Well, it is the case that if we have a collection of uh, mechanisms, each secure against predicate signaling out, what happens if we look at all of them as one big mechanism? Is that still uh, secure? And uh, with Aloni Cohen, we prove that, uh, that it's not the case. There even exist two mechanisms. Each of them is predicate signaling out secure, but when we put them together, they are not secure anymore. So now uh, that we have this modeling, uh, we'd like to make some uh, use of it. And we are going to ask with respect to the two technologies that we presented, differential privacy and anonymity, whether they provide security against predicate singling out. With respect to uh, differential privacy, we can prove that any differentially private mechanism is also uh, predicate singling out secure. So here we get a positive answer. With respect to canonymity, uh, we can ask the same question and we can show uh, that for a large family, which is actually quite typical uh, um, family of canonymizers, um, the canonymizer itself does the hard work for the attacker. The attacker, the, the, the outcome of the canonymizer needs to be complemented with a trivial attacker and hence uh, predicate singling out, uh, uh, the, the attacker manages to predicate single out. So uh, canonymity um, does not withstand um, this requirement. But this, uh, these two questions were with respect to this concept that I just invented and told you about, but the real question is whether these two technologies satisfy the requirements of the general data protection regulation, okay? Uh, and in order to answer this, uh, we'll, we'll try to give a, a partial answer. 
So we'll first review some of the modeling assumptions that we did, and all these uh, modeling assumptions were kind of chosen in order to weaken the, uh, the concept of predicate singling out. What do I mean by that? So we restricted the, the concept in several ways. First, we only considered data that is selected from some underlying distribution, and furthermore, uh, uh, the entries are independent from each other. Then we only gave the attacker A the outcome of the mechanism. In the real world, the attacker usually comes with some other knowledge, which we call auxiliary information, but not in our definition. And lastly, we focused on the case where the attacker uh, outputs descriptions that have very, very small weight, negligible weight, but it may be that uh, uh, that that um, in the real world, or, or the, that the regulator were also uh, interested in other in other in more general uh, uh, set of uh, of descriptions. So what we can conclude is that our formulation is potentially weaker than what the GDPR regulators had in mind for singling out. Okay. It means that failure to protect against predicate singling out likely implies failure to protect against GDPR singling out. So let's see how all this figures together into what uh, we call a legal theorem. Okay, so we need to bridge between the two worlds. On the left we have computer science, on the right we have the law. Okay, on the legal side, uh, we read from the GDPR that there is that it is concerned with this notion of singling out, and if you can single out according to the GDPR, then you fail to anonymize under the GDPR. On the technical side, on the computer science side, uh, we showed things like the following: we presented a concept that we called predicate singling out. And we demonstrated that the anonymity enables predicate singling out. Because the concept of predicate singling out is potentially weaker than the GDPR requirement, this implies through this chain of reasonings that anonymity likely fails to anonymize under the GDPR. With respect to differential privacy, we saw, uh, we can prove that it does not enable, or that it protects again predicate singling out, but this does not tell us yet whether differential privacy is sufficient or insufficient for the GDPR anonymization standard. Going back to the Article 29 party assessment, we think and recommend that they, that they should reconsider their um, uh, determination with respect to anonymity and uh, related technology like and diversity. So let me summarize what we've seen. We started from with a legal notion, or with a legal standard, the GDPR, and from the GDPR we picked this notion of singling out. Uh, we um, try to translate this concept into mathematical language, and we came up with a definition of predict singling out security. Okay, then um, we reasoned that um, predicate singling out does not compose, and we think it like if you follow the, the, the and also the ideas of the proof, it likely implies that also the legal notion, the GDPR singling out and notion of singling out. Um, likely doesn't compose. Okay, this is a weakness. Does not mean that it's a bad concept, but probably means that it needs to be complemented with other requirements. Then uh, we looked at canonization. We showed that it is not predicate signaling out secure, uh, and we think that the, this means that canonization likely does not prevent the GDPR notion of signaling out with differential privacy we can prove that uh, it pre uh, prevents predicate singling out. This gives some evidence that differential privacy prevents the GDPR singling out notion, but we need to further look into this. And lastly, uh, it's interesting that we can also try to uh, 
it would be interesting if, if we would take what we learned in, in our technical analysis and try to build a legal concept based on it. And um, indeed, in our writing, we started working on um, uh, providing legal language that captures some of the understanding that we developed in this work, but there is still a long way to go. Thank you for listening.